the mainstream, the studio machine. I want it my way. Indie film nation. I want it my way. Indie film nation. Going all the way. Indie film nation. You know it's gotta be. Hi and welcome. We are here live at Raindance. My name is Nina Hatchwell and I am doing an interview for Indie Film Nation with the amazing apps. I'm so, feel so privileged to have this interview with Ate Jung, um, all the way from Amsterdam. He's come in this morning for his film Love, Honor and a Bay, which will be film, uh, screened tomorrow. Uh, hi. Hi. Oh, hey, yeah, that's it. It's um, all true. It's all true. Yeah, except my name is slightly differently pronounced. Oh, but, but tell who us. No, it's tell Atta us. de Jong. Atta de Jong. But no, de nobody, Jung. nobody gets it right. So, oh, I, so I'll, I'll respond to anything. I need to. No, I want to get it right. Atta de Jong. Atta de Jung. Tell us a little bit about Love on a Bay and about uh, the screening tomorrow. Yeah, Love on a Bay is, is a temporary title. We might still have to change the title. Uh, but the the film is uh, a film we made in May here in London with British actors. Uh, it's the first film that Raw Talent uh, has produced. Raw Talent is like a subsidiary of Rain Dance, and we want to make more of those films. And the film is basically what you, as a genre, call a home invasion movie, but with, an, with a phenomenal twist in it. So one man gets into a house, uh, sort of like, you know, uh, it captures the two people there, the, 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 the husband and wife who live there. But with all the threats he. Uh, ventures towards these people, he discovers a secret which actually turns everything around. I know that always has to be all everything turns around, but in this case it's true. It does turn around and uh, it is on the one hand quite, quite scary, on the other hand quite specific psychologically. So it's a psychological thriller. It's a psychological thriller. I yeah. love psychological thriller. Yeah, I had my, uh, I had a, a, a test screening in, in, uh, in Holland in my house, I have a big screen there. And I invited the 15 people. Two, three people walked out. My ex walked out because uh, it was too, too scary for me, which is strange because nothing actually happens on screen. It's all in the suggestion. You have, uh, uh, did you direct it in, did you shoot it in London or yeah. in Amsterdam? No, no, it's, it's completely a British film. You know, I, I have made films in Holland, but basically I've made far more films in, in the UK and in America. So I, f I don't feel myself to be a Dutch filmmaker anymore. But I suppose I am because it's my native country and last year I made a film there and uh, which was my first film in 20 years. In but I feel more a UK filmmaker now than I feel like a Dutch filmmaker. And how is it, so you've directed some really big Hollywood classics. Um, <laughs> I mean, Drop Dead Fred is one of my all-time favorite uh, movies as a kid and um, and how is it uh, directing sort of you know much bigger budgets to indie movies what, what do you prefer to do or with how do you pick your projects? Yeah you know you know the, the reality is that for the film making it doesn't really make a big difference I mean Drop That Fat was an independent film but a Hollywood independent film so it had a multi-million dollar budget then even because 20 years ago this film had Virtually no, but the difference is like you know, with Drop That Fred, there was always a car waiting, a limousine, you know, whenever I had to go somewhere, <laughs> and now it was here's a, a token for the subway. Right. So, so in, in practical circumstances, it's different, but in reality of telling the story and working with the actors, it doesn't make that much of a difference. Of course, you know, when, when you have money and you make a mistake during the film, you can correct it. In this case, we had 15 shooting days. If we made a mistake, we had to live. Mm -hmm. So you are more. You have to be more focused. You have to be more alert. But in a way, for what you want to tell, it doesn't make a really big difference. You know, with a small budget film, you can't do a car chase. You can't have a house burning down, or you have to do it in a very special way. You know, you burn it really down, and then you run away and let the uh, fireworks uh, depend uh, and whatever. But 
So there are differences, but as long as you acknowledge the differences and you can dramatically make it work, then for the story it doesn't matter. I always think that, okay, with a big budget, small budget, nobody should know the budget. They have to like the film. See, there's one weird thing, to be honest, uh, about low-budget filmmaking, and it's not the making of the film, it's the distribution. There is a general feeling that if you have a low budget, that's why you're sort of hiding it a little bit, that distributors, sales agents won't take it as serious as if you say, oh, my film costs 10 million. Right. Because if it costs 10 million, you go for it, there must be something, and you know, have to put some money in it because it is a high-budget film. If you say you're very low, they tend to think, oh, God, who cares? You know? And that's the, that's the one thing that we haven't solved about low budget filmmaking. We have to make sure that for distribution it doesn't matter really what the budget is. It's, it's an uphill battle, but you know, we'll get there. What camera did you shoot? Yeah, well, you know, the weird thing is I made last year, uh, I made a film, my first film in Austin, since 20 years, I made a film costing about 6 million euros. We shot that on an Alexa, whatever number I had. <laughs> and this film we shot on the reps with a higher resolution. So the low budget film, which is like peanuts compared, probably 1% of the budget I had from the other film, shot with a better camera. So, strangely enough, these days to make a film for the low budget is not dependent on technical stuff anymore. Everybody can get a good camera, everybody can get good sound, and it's all affordable, which is an enormous liberation for low budget film. Yeah. And so, so we shot, we, we, we started, we, we prepared for about, what is it, six weeks. We, of course, you have very few locations, so we didn't have a lot of transportation. We shot it in 15 days. We did post-production in about two and a half months. And uh, you know that, you know, with, with the other film, that was a much bigger film, had a lot more special effects. Then the post-production was like five months. But we, we didn't have more than five months because we had a release date. In this case, we could have taken like eight months in post-production because we didn't have a release date yet. But then you tie up somebody else who doesn't get a lot paid, so you don't do it. You just do it in one go. And did you uh, edit the first cut yourself? Or did no, you no. I always feel that if you have uh, heads of the part, like a DP, a production designer, music, you know, uh, editing certainly also, you want to use the qualities of those people. I have very specific ideas, but I always hope they find something that I didn't see. And if they're good, they surprise me in a good way. And if, if they don't surprise me in a good way, then, then I'll sell them all. But this and this was the intention, and let's see what works better. So no, I didn't, I, you know, you learn that. At a certain point, you know that other people make you better. And you better use it, because it makes you better. Yeah, it's a real collaborative yeah. effort. Yeah. Thank you very much. That was amazing. Um, I'm, I'm looking forward to going to see Love, on, Honor and Obey. Um, can you just tell us uh, where we can expect to see it? Um, uh, I know you don't know the, the, the new title yet, but... Yeah. I, I, I think we, we go towards the key master because that seems to be the, if you see the film you absolutely will understand that. Okay. But I uh, see the most likely place, of course we'll try to get it in the theatre in a small release, yeah. but then the, the place where you, where the wide audience will see it is on cable and VOD. Cable uh, and VOD. Yeah, that's, that's the most like, and you know, things like Netflix and all that, they all Love come Netflix. up. And, <laughs> and, and you know, we're talking to them now. and. Uh, that's not going to be until I would guess early next year. Uh, but you know, we now the, the last phase of the film starts. The film is finished, apart from maybe the title and a few very, very minor small things. Mm -hmm. And that now it is time to get the distribution and the sales agents started. Great. Well, let's hope Raindance helps you do that. And yeah. um, they should because it's also their money. It's their money, exactly. What was it? Raw, the raw, raw talent. The raw, raw talent. And we're going to make more films in raw talent, about like five a year, uh, all based wow. on a small budget uh, basis. But you know, we will make them. I'll be involved. Elliot will be involved, mm -hmm. and it's going to have to be edgy films, provocative films, and uh, you know, of course, they have restraints. But we want to make indie films that are uh, catering towards a very specific niche audience. Mm -hmm. So you're looking for edgy, provocative yeah. scripts. Yeah. They're going to make that, five that a year. That push the moral boundaries. That push the moral boundaries. 
take note yeah. um, script writers and uh, let us know. Yeah. <laughs> script writer and filmmakers, yeah, because in those I would produce a few, I would not necessarily direct them. Ah, okay, yes, yes, exactly. So directors, writers, get your scripts sent into yeah. raw talent at Raindance. Thank you very much. This is Nina Hatchwell signing out and uh, we are saying goodbye. <laughs>